Hey, it's Jeannie, and aren't you a little tired of talking about the pandemic? At least Vance and I kind of are. You know what? We can give you profound new thoughts on this podcast, but you probably heard about a billion of those. So let us talk to life after the pandemic. Uh, We did some fun research recently that, gosh, I just find so fascinating. Uh, And so we're calling this part one and part two on the podcast to welcome to Generation Z. Generation Z is obviously the youth and young adult culture that we're working with now. And golly, they will be so deeply impacted by what's going on with the pandemic. But it's our hope that through this podcast and part two that will follow it, that you will be a little bit more intentional in what characterizes them by the research and how you can most effectively connect with them. So, hey, it is pandemic season. We're still all stuck in our homes. And yes, I am social distancing. Bah humbug, but I know it's what I ought to do. So I'm being a good little girl. Cadre, I love you. And any of you who maybe want to sign up, go to the website, uh, geniemayo.com, and you'll see the application for the cadre because uh, we launch back up at the end of the summer. So welcome to this podcast entitled Welcome to Generation Z. Welcome to Jeannie Mayo's 100X Leadership Podcast. My amazing assistant here, Vance, are we having a good day? Having a great day. Shirt is cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, as is yours. The shoes are even cooler. Everybody noticed. That's the only reason why we're friends. Because it's (laughs) a great shoe game. And we're going to have fun talking about something. I want to, I want to do this particular podcast in a part one and a part two. And we're going to call it Welcome to Generation Z. Mm. And today we're going to unpack what uh, what characteristics define Generation Z. Okay, now I know we all go to sleep at night putting numbers together in our head. Right. Tell me, if, if you look it up, who's Generation Z? Well, the numbers vary sometimes, but it's, it's about, it's people born from around 1996 to 2012. Which obviously is a, a whole lot of people yeah. that we're dealing with yeah. every day of our lives. Now, uh, you know, sometimes, especially having been in youth ministry a lot of decades, I, I get frustrated with everybody that act like you're no good unless you know all these things to be cool and trendy yeah. with the particular whatever generation it is. So talk to me. Why should I even give a rip about knowing characteristics of Generation Z? That's a great question. Um, I think that I had to ask myself the same question and I've realized it's because these are the people who, these are people who we're working with. These are people who we're hiring. Um, These are people who we are trying to have productive teams with. Right. Um, these are people who, if from a pastoring standpoint, these are people I'm pastoring, right. speaking to. Uh, if you preach, you're preaching to these people. Uh, and it's a whole, each generation kind of has a mindset that's, that's been really cultivated true. by the way that they've grown up. And if this is a, a generation that has a slightly different mindset or very different mindset than we have, we have to know how to connect with them. Yeah. And I, I love, I read it just the other day, First Chronicles 12, verse 32 in the New Living, where it talks about uh, the men of Issachar. And we've all read it from the tribe of Issachar. There were 200 leaders and all of these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for mm. Israel to take. Mm. So, gosh, you know, if you need it biblical, which we do. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you got it there. Now, That's who good. are these people? Uh, I, I just want to come to what for me is the big boulder before we go any further. And then we're going to unpack five key markers of, of Generation Z. 
but the largest percentage of these people when asked uh, where they're at spiritually uh, would not call themselves agnostics, mm -hmm. would not call themselves atheists. Mm -hmm. They would simply say nothing. Mm -hmm. And, and I just want to pause to lean into all of us and say that needs to terrify us. Because really what it's saying is uh, matters of faith have become so buried mm. that it's not even worth putting on your radar. Mm. Does that make sense? I mean, this is indeed the first truly post-Christian generation. Mm. Now we've heard that term thrown around for lots of years. but. Mm. Statistically, before, you would hear much higher numbers of atheist, agnostic, all of that stuff. But now it's like, why is faith even a relevant question? Hmm. And, and so let's unpack some of these particular characteristics. First of all, uh, Generation Z is recession marked. Hmm. Uh, one of the most defining events in their lifetime was the Great Recession, which we all know began around 2007. And it, real interestingly enough, that helps to explain why so many of this generation embraces socialism. You mm -hmm. know, you yeah. heard all the stats about Bernie Sanders. Yeah. If you just looked at the millennials, he got by far the largest percentage because socialism would guarantee, you know, you're never going to lack, yeah, yeah. In the, at least in their mind, yeah. recession mark. That's real interesting. You got any thoughts on that? I think that that, that was one of the most interesting things that, uh, in my opinion, that marks the generation, because I wouldn't have expected that. No, no. Me um, either. That me as either. kids, this generation was, because I personally, I'm a millennial. Right. And I was in college when the recession took place and I wouldn't view that as like mm -hmm. a life changer for mm -hmm. me. It was just mm -hmm. like something that happened. We lived through it. Right. But to say that that's marked um, them as a generation, even to the point that, you know, from a working standpoint, they view jobs differently. Absolutely. Like the jobs they're Absolutely. looking for, what they're looking for in a job Absolutely. is very different Absolutely. Um, to the point that they're more like. That generation is more like the generation before me when mm -hmm. it comes to what they're looking for in a job Absolutely. than, uh, than they are like us. And yeah. so I just thought that that was fascinating. It is fascinating. And it says also in the stats that that's part of the reason why many of them are entrepreneurial. Yeah. Because it's that sense of, hey, I'm going to be able to make it on my own mm. even if my employer goes belly up. Yeah. My security is not based in anybody else. Yeah. So the obvious. Then trait number two, this is the first generation to be what uh, the sociologists call Wi-Fi fully enabled. Mm. And obviously Wi-Fi was around, but they call it internet in my pocket generation. Mm. Um, and it, interesting, it says first generation uh, that, that that is a part of what Bernstein says is the fourth communication revolution. The first was language itself. The second was writing. The third was the mechanism of writing, printing mm. press, in other words. But the fourth is the electronic encoding mm. of information. And, and so currently, if many of you that are with us, you work with youth and young adult culture, uh, it, everybody has a different stat. We totally get it. But in my research, currently teenagers spend nearly nine hours a day absorbing some form of media. Now, mm. when I first heard that, Vance, I said to you, could that even be true statistically? Talk to me about when I say some form of media, why? It, I certainly yeah. can't even compute that. Why is yeah. it not that Far crazy. I don't think it's that far fetched because I mean, a lot of times we're thinking that it's just like, oh, they're spending nine hours a day on YouTube. That's not right. necessarily it. No. It's just that so much of what we're doing comes through technology that some form of media, that's not too far of a stretch, whether it's your cell phone, your computer, um, the way that they're getting assignments 
for homework Absolutely. is different. Um, and from a work standpoint now, I mean, emails, oh, yeah. I mean, there's just, uh, yeah, you can spend, I mean, you can easily spend your whole work day Absolutely. <laughs> consuming Absolutely. Them, something. And so um, I don't think it's all that far-fetched. We're very technology driven. And, and so uh, the obvious implications for us in leadership. Then number three, and this one, you go, it's a no brainer, but it's really impacting. This is the first generation to totally embrace racial diversity. Mm. And we would all say, yay, that yeah. we're all embracing racial diversity, but it's real interesting. The majority of immigrants coming into our country uh, are from uh, Mexico, Central America, Caribbean. Between 2000 and 2010, the Hispanic population in America multiplied four times. Man. And it's really interesting since the beginning of the 1700s, the number one last name in America was Smith. Hello. <laughs> That's his last name. <laughs> but you lose now, yeah. but somebody else on our staff doesn't because now the most common American name is Rodriguez. Man. Thank you, Javier. Man. You know, yeah. isn't that really true? Yeah. So, gosh, now racial diversity is, is something that is so expected. Yeah. And for anybody in any leadership world to be in any way sensitive to that makes them to appear very, very dated. And mm. then number four, and this one, if you, if you're biblically grounded, this one throws you a little bit. This is the first generation to be totally sexually fluid. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a no brainer. And you go, yeah, yeah, I know. No, don't go. Yeah, yeah, I know. What do I mean? Obviously, totally sexually fluid. What do I mean by that? Um, that there are just no, there's no rules. There's no standard. Yeah. yeah. Where um, there's no normal in, a, in, uh, from, in terms of the mindset. It, it's actually trying to, the, the mindset is to try to erase normal and redefine normal as whatever you want, whoever you are, yeah. whatever you're feeling is normal. And to try to erase the stigmas, um, negative viewpoints uh, towards any particular preference or choices, which is very different than any other generation. Absolutely. Really interesting stats tell us that 74% of Generation Z think that it's, it's just great to be even transgender. Mm -hmm. 74%. Yeah. So, you know, all of the different panorama there. As we take a look at it, the only thing that's not acceptable is to have what people would consider a bias. Yeah. You know, it needs to be man and woman together. And they equate that to being judgmental, mm -hmm. condescending. And yet it, those of us that choose to follow a biblical lifestyle are pretty clear when we look at the Word of God that the Word of God clearly says a man is to give himself to one woman. Yeah. And, and uh, man, we're so blessed. We happen to be in a church that though it's never communicated from the platform in a defensive, negative, pounding posture, yeah. Uh, we've got a senior pastor who has enough guts to say it's not okay yeah. to go any direction. Yeah. And then last of all, and this is the one I want to unpack a little bit more, Vince, last uh, major factor for Generation Z is first generation, and I already referenced this before, that is truly post Christian. Mm. And that's so easy. And interestingly enough, the younger the demographic is, the greater the percentage of the category of people that Barna calls just religiously unaffiliated, the mm. nuns. Mm. And, and so, gosh, uh, all right, just real briefly, and I don't even know what you say on this. What are some indicators to you that we're living in a post-generation, post-Christian generation with Generation Z? What do you see in them? I think just what you said earlier, that most 
of most of the younger generation now wouldn't define themselves as as any particular religion. Uh, it's not really their priority no. to have clarity on no. truth. No. There's a huge emphasis on your own truth yes. and whatever you believe and, and accepting everybody else's truths. And so, That's so true. I think that I think that it's interesting. Um, I think from a post-Christian standpoint, yes. um, most of the time, I know growing up, it was normal to just identify as Christian. And I, I, I've heard a I heard an interesting quote by Ed Stetzer where he said it it appears that in America Christianity is collapsing, when in fact Christianity is being clarified. Because it's, it's really interesting. Because yeah. we're moving away from cultural Christianity, uh, which I think is good for us that people aren't just loosely affiliating themselves with Christ. But there is a there's a line being drawn where right. people don't feel the need to be a Christian because their parents were Christians right. and it's normal to be a Christian and they don't ever go to church or read the Bible or engage with Christ, but uh, still affiliate themselves as Christians. That. So I think that that's what we're really moving away from. Okay, I'm going to cheat. I said I was going to give five characteristics, but on my note, there's one that I buried underneath number five that I want stand alone. Yeah. So do you think I can change to six characteristics? I think you have the freedom. Hosanna. <laughs> six one, which is, man, so riveting. This is the first generation to be what stats to call leaderless. Mm. Let me read this off my notes. Little, if any, direction is coming from their families, their parents, and even less from their attempts to access guidance from the Internet. And, and that's really true because the questions that I hear sometimes from teenagers or even people in their 20s border on, in my mind, heartbreaking sometimes. And, and please get this. They have endless amounts of information but very little wisdom. Mm. Isn't that true? Mm. And virtually no mentors. Mm. And so for all of us that want to make a difference uh, in some form of Christian leadership, that's heartbreaking, but that is an amazing open door. Yeah. Because I still believe that it will not be and certainly what power in the pulpit. I'm not underestimating the proclamation and the word of God yeah. in the pulpit. But gosh, Generation Z, to have somebody who takes personal interest. Yeah. That's everything. Yeah. And I'm not Generation Z. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought I'd tell you that because I know you didn't know. But but the issue is that's still the big deal for me. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and so as we look at it, those are the, no, not five, but six signatures of this generation that we're dealing with now. And then if you just will check with us for the next podcast, we're going to talk to you about how to deal some really simple things that research says about being effective as you deal with those people. So again, listen, it's us just saying, hey, Thank you for being a part of the 100x multiplying journey for us. Absolutely. And I say it all the time as a 100x person, it's not so much what you do, but who you are. Absolutely. So thanks for taking these few minutes with us just to remind yourself that we want to be a person who multiplies, not just a person who exists. Make sure you catch us for the next time. We're going to take a moment to unpack again what the stats tell us about how you best engage this generation. Z.